All right, let's welcome in Blake Griffin. Blake, so good to see you. First of all, we have a lovely 2008 Rousseau Chambertin that we decided to share with you today. Um, and it's a real treat for us because up until you committed to doing this, I actually didn't know you did podcasts other than part of my take. So this is- no, Are uh, they going to be pissed about this? Yeah. They'll probably be pissed, but I, I dabble in other podcasts. So, uh, those guys, you know, we'll see if they listen, you know? They may, you're right. They may not listen. They're going to know. Anyways, Cheers. Cheers, guys. Thanks for having me. Yep, Thank yep. you for the wine. Yep. Um, Tommy, I got to tell you a golf story real quick. <laughs> Great. Um, so Blake and I uh, had not hung out in about four years in person, which we'll maybe get to, depending on how much wine we drink. Um, but I played with him and a couple buddies at my course out in the Hamptons. And the, the first hole, the, the fairway sort of slopes to the left, and there's some fairway bunkers. Mm. If you're like the longer drivers, you can sort of carry that fairway bunker down into this little mini valley. It leaves you about 120 yards. It's sort of a blind shot. Blake <laughs> tees off and he hits the ball farther than any human being I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> he hits it over the bunkers, over the mini valley, and lands it softly on the first green of the par three course, which sits adjacent to the first hole. I was just looking at the wrong, <laughs> you know, the first time of the course, things can the get happy, confusing. The happy good work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And I, I swear to God, like that was probably the most incredible athletic feat I've ever seen you do. <laughs> I've seen you do some cool shit. Well. <laughs> no, thanks man, appreciate it. Missing, uh, missing the, the, the actual green and, and hitting the par three green is probably the coolest thing I've ever done. <laughs> On the golf course, at least. Legitimately into the wind, 320 yards. Like, legitimately. Um, I do want to ask you about your golf game, though, oh. because I know you you just picked it up, mm -hmm. uh, and your swing is great. Like, I was just so impressed with your swing, and you've been playing, like, three or six, three to six, three to six months, basically? Uh, oh. I started playing in July. I played my first round in July. So, July 15th or something like that. Yeah. I'm not are you gonna be Are you going to become a hardo about it like him? Oh, I, I, I'm already there. <laughs> I uh, play tomorrow. Um, I know I was supposed to play with you tomorrow. <laughs> taking lessons. Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, we got Bruce Brown instead, so. Okay, it's fine. You know, still, it's still pros versus shows. Yeah, we played, um, me too, Me and him, we teamed up. We played by handicap, and we gave the fourth guy who didn't have a handicap, we gave him a lot of strokes. And we came, I think we won like 360 bucks. <laughs> yeah. It was a good day. We won a lot. <laughs> Uh, I my first question is I want your favorite story of JJ being a dickhead. Uh, like play, play, on the same team. On the same team. Mm, <laughs> on the same. Boy. Team. Yeah. Maybe first story and also favorite story. I'm sure the first story was like the first or second day. Like nothing specific comes to mind. <laughs> um. Yeah, I can't really. I, I feel like. This is, uh, first of all, this is funny I'm, to me. I'm because a dick. <laughs> so, so most of the time people do stuff and I'm like, ha, nice. <laughs> the, re the, re the reason why I ask this is we have an ongoing theme on this show where JJ, this started when we had Mike Conley on mm -hmm. because everybody said ahead of time that Mike is like the nicest guy in the NBA. Mm -hmm. Like everyone, yeah, yeah, yeah. it was like five different people were like, oh, we love Mike, da, 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 nicest guy in the NBA. I told JJ that he's like, Fuck that. Like, nice, like Mike's nice. Like, he thinks Mike's a really nice guy, but he's like, I'm the nicest guy in the NBA. So oh, then I went no. back to those people and I was like, is this true? And they all were like, no. Like, JJ is very smart and very everything, but he's not the nicest person in the NBA. And so since then, we've decided to bring this up with different people. Well, uh, like, being the nicest person in the NBA, is that's a that's a feat. Like, you got to, yeah. like, really be on your game at all times. Like, I, 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 don't, I wouldn't want to be the nicest person in the NBA. I don't think I ever said I was the nicest oh, okay. person in the NBA. You Dude, do this a lot. That is a <laughs> you do this a lot. You do this a lot. Okay. All right. Give me some more made up JJ quotes. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, so my the first time that I played against Blake as a as a non member of the Sixers or non member of the Clippers was with the Sixers and it was early in the season. And I can't remember if okay. like somehow we got tied up and we had to jump against each other on a jump ball. Or if it was a long rebound, no, but anyway, it was a long rebound. It was a long rebound. Long so rebound. you remember this too, okay? Yeah. yeah. So the ball very went bad. up, and I like, I like, very I like came in, and I don't really jump for rebounds all that much, but I jumped for this particular rebound, and Blake jumped as well, and just body mass wise, there's just more mass there on Blake's part, and so he knocks me over, and he's standing over me, 
And I thought at first that he was like joking. And then I realized I saw the look on his face and I was like, this guy's not joking. He's really trying to be a dick right now. So I, yes, so I tried to kick him in the balls, but I had a weird angle. <laughs> he like brought his foot up. But what did, what did I do when I came down? You stood over me. Oh. Like you were trying to intimidate me or no, something. No, no, that's not true at all. Okay. All right. True. Well, that's how I read the. That's we how should, I read it. Can we pull up that clip? <laughs> yeah, let's pull this up. I don't, think, I don't think that random long rebound in, in October <laughs> is going to be on YouTube. It's November third. Uh, November third. Oh, okay. But I like the fact, actually. Like, yeah. Some assholes can't admit that they're an asshole. Like, I can admit that at times I'm an asshole. Oh, My yeah. wife would agree. I'm sure, Kylie and Jason would also agree that are in the room right now. Like. It's okay. It's oh, okay. Yeah. Middle is uh, a, a good first step. I'm not an asshole all the time, but I'm an asshole, especially like playing basketball. Do you, <laughs> do you feel? Do you feel like you're an asshole of the referees? Yeah, I've, I've gotten I've gotten better here or there, but yeah, a lot of like some 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 referees. Some referees I have a great relationship with, and and we like every single time never have like an issue. Or, like, sometimes you can say something to them and, like, they're just, like, honest. I have a problem with the guys who, like, get so – I mean, I, names will come to mind as soon as I say this, but they're just, like, so fucking cool. And they you can't say anything to them. And then they just kind of, like, do this thing where they, like, act like they're, you know, yeah. they're too good to, like, answer your question. Right. Especially if you come in the right way. Sometimes yeah. you don't come in the right way and you get that. But, like, if you come in the right way – to them and then they still don't give you any time like that that's that's what really bothers me and there's like several that just pop right into my mind <laughs> um, i just thought of five names super quick i generally speaking yeah. i think they have a very hard job i think they do a good job the the you know it's hard with the interpersonal stuff in the middle of competition maybe you're having an off game uh, maybe it's you're going to get something and uh, going against another player and it's super personal and you want to win that battle. Like there's all these different th you know, factors in this. And it's, it's, it's really hard. I, I remember my sort of my first two months on the Sixers though. And I mean, I pretty much every game a referee would come up to me in warmups and be like, yo, I'm so glad you're not on that team anymore. Because CP and Blake are such dickheads to us. <laughs> that you know what's crazy is refs came to me and said that in Detroit. <laughs> so glad you're not on on the, on oh, the that's so exact funny. same thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, for sure. I, I uh, that's like one thing that I, I just can't really control. Sometimes, <laughs> like I'll go into a game and be like, all right, stay off these guys. <laughs> you know, they're trying, um, and just like. Especially certain things, I, I think I, I think I have gotten better now. I mean, I still like give some refs some 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 looks, but I, I think I've definitely gotten better. And I think some I, a good amount of refs would probably say that as well. Yeah. Did you did you have a teammate when you were just coming into the league? Not who was an asshole, but like their level of intensity kind of set the tone for you about like this is the NBA now. This isn't college anymore. To be honest, no, not not until my like second third year. Uh, my first year was just, you know, my vets were Chris Kamen. <laughs> uh, great guy. I love him. <laughs> have some great Chris Kamen stories. I mean, Marcus Camby was on the team, but this, again, it's toward the, towards the end of his career. Alf Thornton, Eric Gordon, DeAndre were both, you know, rookie or coming off their rookie year when I got there. So I didn't really like have like a real true like vet vet until. You know, like when CP came, then it was like Chauncey and Grant Hill. And then we had Lamar Odom and we had like, Ron Roni Turioff, all these guys, and then eventually JJ came. <laughs> but by that time, I was vetted out. <laughs> I had my bet. <laughs> but by the time we we were teammates, we were kind of at the same stage of our life and our careers too, in a, in a way. Like you've obviously had a better career than me, but <clears throat> I mean, I feel like we hit it off. You know what I mean? It was it was not like the vet young fellow yeah, yeah, relationship yeah. that you can have. That team um, like made you get older. And, uh, or made you sort of grow up faster because everybody was just like old, older. Yeah. Like we didn't, we had a young team when I first got there and then it was just me and DeAndre for like ever. And we'd have like a rookie come in. We'd have one rookie. Yeah. We had one like rookie every year. CJ Wilcox. We had Reggie Bullock. Reggie Bullock. Um, Trey Tom. Bryce Johnson right at the end. I was, oh, I was after Trey. That, yeah. yeah. There was a lot of vets. Yeah. A lot of vets. Um, I want to actually start with the basketball stuff. I want to start uh, with, with last year actually. Mm -hmm. And and sort of the buyout with Detroit, picking the Nets, mm -hmm. 
um, you know, that decision to sort of accept the buyout and, and go to a contender, what all went into that? Um, so I think it might be easy. Like, so last season, when the season started, Derek can I get there and, and, you know, we've now traded away Andre Drummond the previous year, right before the bubble, uh, Reggie Jackson buyout, I think it was, um, got rid of Markeith Morris, got, you know, got rid of our older guys. And so they put this team together and we're kind of like, they, they're telling us we want to be competitive. You know, we want to, we want to like, but what are you going to say? Um, and so they, they bring us in like, I think the second or third day of training camp and they're like, Hey, you know, we want to be mentor. We want you guys to be mentors to these guys. Um, which is, you know, <laughs> the writing is on the wall and me and him are cool with that. That was, that was totally fine. Like, you know, I, we had a lot of respect for coach Casey and, and, uh, Arn tell him over there, you know, like guys, guys that we all know. Um, and you know, for Derek, you know, it was a lot easier to get moved. Um, and you know, I remember like shortly after that, he was like, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I just kind of like stuck it out. I was like trying to be, you know, I was trying to be a, a, a sort of a mentor to the young guys and, and, you know, accept my role, not come in and like take like a bunch of shots and just be like that guy. They had averaged like a career low in shots. I think I was shooting 10 times a game, like wasn't playing that much. Also wasn't playing well at all. Um, and so when the, when they finally came to me at beginning of February and they were like, Hey, like we're just going to accept this full, full tank in a way or develop our young guys. Um, I honestly just didn't, I didn't, I didn't put as much thought into it. I was just ready for like a new, a new situation. And I also like felt bad in a way. Like I, I, I was out there every day, like trying, but I just couldn't, I couldn't get my legs back up under me after, after our training camp, like felt good going into it. Couldn't get my yeah. legs back under me after a training camp. And I kind of felt bad in a way. And I was like, you know what, this will probably be best for everybody, you know, give some money back. They get to do their thing. They get to um, play their young guys. And, and I thought it was like a, a good thing for both sides. Did you, during that little break where kind of, they announced that you'd be kind of yeah. sitting out, we're going to work on a buyout. Mm -hmm. You eventually sign with Brooklyn. You get a couple weeks, I think, before you played no, I got, a game. Yeah, six weeks. Six weeks. So, I, so you I, had like two months, basically, two, two and a half months where had, you got to work had, on your body. I had nine weeks where I think, uh, maybe not that. It was beginning of February and I didn't play till two weeks after. Yeah, basically end of March. Yeah. Maybe seven weeks. Okay. Um, yeah, so I went home. They, you know, they said, you know, we totally get if you just want to work out. Uh, we're probably not going to play you that much. And I was like, you know, if it's all the same, I'm just going to go concentrate on, on getting right. So I went back, worked out, um, got to work out for like six weeks in L.A., when I got to Brooklyn, worked out for like two weeks before they let me play a game there. And that was a huge, huge difference for me. Like getting a, I mean, when do you ever get six week break where you're not injured? Right. Uh, in the middle of the season to kind of get your legs back under you. How, uh, it seemed like you were relishing the, um, once you got to Brooklyn and you started dunking, it seemed like you were really relishing trying sort of, to dunk. Yeah, not just that, but like, well, I mean, you were hyper aware of the chatter on social about, you know, there were some memes about you not dunking or dunking once with the Pistons. Yeah, I mean, to be season. honest, like it, that it's it bothered me a little bit <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because the stat was he hasn't dunked in 400 something days. Sure. <laughs> I, you guys I, also weren't in the bubble. So <laughs> well, I also had surgery in, in the, no in January. I played my last game for the Pistons. Uh, before the bubble or before the pandemic hit, it, like December 20th or something like that, 28th of 19, I mean, 2019. Yeah. And then we didn't go to the bubble. So then I didn't play again until <laughs> December 24th of 2020. So everybody's like, he hasn't dunked in over a year. I was like, I haven't played in over a year. <laughs> but then, you know, I played those like 19 games with the Pistons and didn't dunk. Um, so that's like kind of what it, it just like, that just pissed me off. Cause it's just like, you, you guys know the stat <laughs> you're just like yeah. choosing to be like, let's do days instead of games. <laughs> Cause games is still like, oh, he hasn't been to 19, 19 games or we could do, or hear me out. We could do just straight days. <laughs> and it's like, I don't know. It is funny. It's like with you, it's like, you haven't made a three pointer in this number of days. Like you can arbitrarily decide yeah. anything fits in that. Thing. Yeah. When's the last time you made a three in the NBA game? <laughs>
Actually, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe May 8th, I, I I'll, I'll guess. <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> it's 172 days. Uh, what, was your, what was your first... Uh, obviously, you've played not on the same team, but you've played with all these guys, uh, yeah. you know, going back to high school with, with Kevin. Like, what was your first thought when you got onto this group just with the amount with the level of talent that's obviously here in terms of like oh shit everyone is on one team for me man it was just like trying to come in and, and fill like the, the voids that they had you know obviously those guys are unbelievable and they had a great team and they had guys to do that but i think now uh, more so than ever like my game is sort of suited to that being able to sort of you know stretch the floor a little bit or you know short roll and pass out of there um defend a little bit rebound take the ball in the break so for me it was just about going to a place where i could play like some meaningful basketball and you know fill a fill a role um but it wasn't it wasn't i talked to i talked to some good teams and and i just felt like that was a a good good place for me there was a a bunch of talk last spring about you know first of all that the nets get Kevin and Kyrie, then they trade for James. And then, you know, you pick there, LaMarcus picks there. Um, there were rumors that I was going to pick there as well. Were you prepared for the backlash? <laughs> I was. Me and LaMarcus have started a, a support group for yeah. guys that join the Nets. Uh, but, like, I, like I, it's part of a larger conversation about just the, the buyout situation in general. Because I do believe historically when players get bought out, at that stage of a season, especially veterans, they go and join a contender. Yeah. I can't remember many times where they go and join a, a young team that's trying to tank, right? The, the real value to them at that stage in their career yeah. is trying to win a championship. Mm-hmm. Uh, are you asking, was, <laughs> what was I thinking about joining a, a no, non-contender? I'm just saying, like, oh, what, okay. is, what was different last year than in any other no, season? I, don't, I have no idea. I mean, it, it happens every year, and you always, like, you always see it and i guess as players you're just kind of like yeah it makes that makes sense but then you know i, I think it's just the whole i mean you know what it is <laughs> people don't like people don't they, they don't they don't they don't like they want like kd and like these guys to like do it on their own when yeah. nobody does it on their own i also think it's really funny i guess when since we're on the subject i think it's really funny like you know everybody like really shit on lebron like lebron was kind of the first guy everybody shit on for like joining the Celtics did it. <laughs> they brought KG and Ray Allen to team up with Paul Pierce. Yeah, but I've said this before, and I'll stick by it. Uh, the Celtics did it uh, by uh, front office, right? It wasn't. It wasn't the LeBron thing. Sort of set off this player empowerment era. And, and you're talking about through free agency. Well, yeah, by 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 linking up with D Wade and Chris Bosh, and like we're all going to go to the same place together. Like having these conversations behind closed doors with USA Basketball, yeah, yeah. whatever it may be. Whereas with the Celtics, it was like Danny Ainge, the mastermind up in the front office, Are you saying putting a, exa- a super team. I'm saying exactly it's too how it happened, or that's like the narrative. How, that's the how, how, that's the narrative. So yeah. I'm saying what bothered people about LeBron yeah, yeah. was that it was a player or players doing this and right. not a team doing this. Yeah. I don't think that's that far off. I, I want to bring up this quote. You, I hate to bring up. Pardon my take again, but I thought it was a great <laughs> quote. Um, I'm paraphrasing here uh this is in response to some backlash you received uh when you did get the buyout with detroit you said 18 19 season i was an all-star i was all nba i had a few dunks i even played injured in the playoffs yeah i'd hate me too if i was detroit <laughs> oh, that, this is the asshole thing you're talking about <laughs> no 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 i i but look i i this is what i find very interesting is like it doesn't matter what you've done for a team, what you've put yourself through to try to be the best version of you that you can be. Like 99% of player exits are acrimonious. Yeah. 99%. Why do you think that is? I think it's, with sports, it's just like, it's the lot, you know, you hear the term all the time, what have you done for me lately? Like, it's just, it doesn't matter. Like, it doesn't matter if you if you played for eight years and never missed a game if you go out on a bad note like <laughs> it's just, that's the only thing fans really remember yeah um some fans in a way but um that i, I that whole i was doing like this uh it's like a 
trading card auction thing. So we were just like, just saying whatever, just like, and so I just went off on that tangent. I think because we I, we pulled a AI Detroit card. Okay. And yeah, okay, so it, that sort of came out of like nowhere, but um, I, I stand by some of that. I had to sort of deal this deal with this as well because I sp- with the Pelicans. But oh, I, yeah, I, yeah, look, yeah, I spent yeah. I spent a year and a half there. I love New Orleans. I I actually actually loved the organization. You chose New Orleans. I chose New Orleans. Yeah. I chose New Orleans. I didn't get traded there. Um, I chose New Orleans, and I go on a podcast and I basically say that one person was dishonest. You're very specific. It was disclaimer. Yeah. Disclaimer. Still love New Orleans. Yeah. Still had a great experience with the organization. Yeah. And all of a sudden it's like, I like y'all are going to stand for this dude. <laughs> like, oh. I don't get it. It's my uncle. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I actually, I actually stand with the New Orleans fans on this one. Talking about family. Uh, I love it. I mean, I'm not, I, I look, I'm, there's there's some nuance to everything. There's yeah. some nuance to everything. There's some nuance to how you left Detroit or how oh, you left sure. the Clippers. Um, but uh, you know, nothing pains us as players more than not playing well. And for me, it was not playing well. You know what I mean? Like that killed me. I, you know me. Yeah. I, there's there's no there's no situation <laughs> where I would ever want to be like, no, I'll just like shoot ten times and be <laughs> awful, and I'll get myself out of this situation. I would have much rather been yeah. great. I just I didn't I didn't have it in me. Yeah. Like I, for, I, for the circumstance, I just couldn't get my legs back under me that entire season. Yeah. I mean, it was it was like a month, but yeah. Well, for me with New Orleans, it was however many games I played, thirty five, thirty six, whatever it was of last season. Of last season, yeah, I yeah. just. You know, with the Achilles injury, it was just like I couldn't. I wasn't myself, you yeah. know. And yeah. it's like, well, no, I'm trying. I'm I'm really trying. Peak Blake Griffin. Was that 13, 14, 14, 15? Was that Detroit G- G- Blake Griffin? Because I I feel like the Detroit Blake Griffin was the sort of confluence of like your skill level being super high your basketball IQ, intelligence being super high, your athleticism still being there. But then like there was like the young Blake Griffin pre sort of yeah. injuries in 13, 14, 14, 15. Which, which do you think was your peak? I felt the most like, uh, I don't want to say like dominant, but I felt like I was, I was in control of my game the most. Um, like that stretch, like leading up to the playoffs in fourteen, fifteen, and then in the playoffs, you know, when we played San Antonio and Houston, that was when I felt like I, you know, had had different parts of my game going at like so, the best level they've been a part of. Not really the three, but yeah, I wasn't really shooting those then. But um, I don't know. That's just when I felt like I was in control the most. So that thirteen, fourteen season, I, I had finally sort of figured some of the like the mental aspects of the game out yeah um where you slow down and you, you take your time and you, you sort of you know try to dissect the game a little bit more but i think 14 15 like the end of that season because even that season that was when i had the um the bursitis the elbow, yeah. the elbow infection yeah. yeah um so i missed some games for that like not really an injury but i missed some games for that I want to. We're going to get to the injury part in a second because it's i think it's a really interesting conversation given the <clears> amount of attention you take uh or put you know on your body and your training and your diligence and all that stuff um i do want to mention in in 19 with the pistons you somehow you know over the not somehow through hard work but you developed into uh basically a stretch big that could do a lot of different other things you shot 36 percent from three seven attempts a game um i watched you for four years before practice after practice working on your craft working on your shot can you sort of just describe in a way like point A to point B? Point B being I'm all of a sudden a high volume above average league three point shooter. Um, it started after my rookie year. That was like when I hired a shooting coach and just completely reworked my shot. And that was like one of the most frustrating things I've done <laughs> in the game of basketball. I mean, I would always tell him like he'd be like just trust just trust me like you're gonna and I love I love this guy Bob Tay he's like a he's, he's he's great I just talk to him still to this day all the time and and he would just be like just trust me like you're gonna get there and I'm like Bob 
I have to, sh- I have to be able to make shots now. I don't know if you know what I do for a living. <laughs> People aren't going to be happy. Um, but it was like, we started with like three or four things. So it was like, his thing was like, you know, I always kind of like faded back on my jump shot. I, I, uh, would shoot on the way down and I still have like those tendencies, you know what I mean? Like that's just like the tendency of my shot. So we would start with those things and just drill them over and over and over and over and over. He has this stat of how many shots I shot one summer and it's it's insane. It's so stupid how many do shots you, I do had. Do you remember the number? I can't, but I, I'll ask him. Okay. Um and so you know, every every summer, every every year, I mean you saw you Bob was still there when you were there. Yep. Um, we would be there, you know, before every practice, after practice, I would just be putting in the time and, um, I'm so glad I started then if I hadn't, you know, I might have missed my window. Right. Why'd you, why'd you decide after your, your rookie year? Because I was looking at the numbers your rookie year earlier today. I mean, you were ripping off, you had about 27 double doubles in a row at one point. Like you're, mm-hmm. you're, you had a great rookie season. Yeah, but I just like everything was around the rim. I mean, I shot think- some face up jumpers out of the post, but I wasn't like a good, I, you know, I wasn't a good. You just didn't think it was there. It no, wasn't. no, it wasn't. It wasn't. I and mean, just by like my oh. my eye test, like I, I started shooting the ball like differently than how I shot when I was like in high school or like growing up. I just like got to this point, I think, like, I don't know, sort of when you're kind of like you're, you're developing, you know, and you're starting to get stronger, you're doing all this stuff. And, you know, back then, like, dude, bigs were. Like, so much bigger. I saw this picture of JaVale McGee the other day when he was, when he was with the Nuggets. Remember how big he was? He was huge. Yeah, like, then he went vegan. To, yeah. Then he went vegan. Yep. He used to put weight on, like, all of us. Like, college, every big guy coming in, you have to, like, you try to get as big as possible. And that just I think that just kind of, like, sort of messed with my shot over time. So I knew, like, that my shot wasn't where it needed to be. And, you know, also, like, that, you know, Dirk was shooting threes. Kevin Love was shooting threes. Like, you could see that's where it was going. Yeah. Tommy, I think it's a great question because I th- think it also speaks to something about Blake from being around him for four years, and that's aspiration. Like, Blake won Rookie of the Year with an asterisk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see the asterisk on the trophy. Oh, you didn't see no, it? No, I actually have the trophy. The trophy? <laughs> no. I rubbed it off. <laughs> but, I, I, like, correct me if I'm wrong, Blake. The, like, your aspiration – throughout your career has been to be the best player not yeah. like the best player in the world not yeah. the not the best player on your team not an all-star but the best player in the world yeah that's just like a, i don't i don't think there's anything wrong and you also having a real understanding of, of <laughs> who you actually are yeah you know but yeah i don't think that like, i think every player should want to try to be the best player in the world like why not when blake and i were teammates i, w- I would be doing my um <clears throat> lights would go out for the you know the starting lineup and i do i have this little routine that i do um before the the, the clippers would do a, uh, their starting lineup blake would be dabbing everybody up and he'd cover come over to me last and i'd say to him best player in the world blake and then he'd look at me and be like second best shooter in the world JJ. <laughs> <laughs> and i'd say hey remember elbow up and out elbow okay. up and out i believe in you <laughs> my favorite actually truthfully my favorite pregame ritual um was uh, as soon as we we broke the team meeting in the pregame, there's like, you know, 21 on the clock, 22 on the clock. We're all going out for warm-ups at 18 on the clock. And I, every it's like clockwork. I turn the corner to go to the bathroom, and Blake's in front of the mirror, <laughs> miming his form. That was a Bob Tate thing. So, uh, you know, now you're looking at an average three-point shooter, so who's laughing now? This is how the, mad, this is how the butter gets churned. It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> I still do that. And you know, it's funny. I think I told this story to one of my team. I think I might've told Luke Kennard because one time when I was, I was doing it, you know, same yeah. routine. <laughs> he like looks over at me and starts laughing. And I go, I was like, dude, how many times you seen me do this? I think I said that to you too. Like I'm going to do it before every game. <laughs> and I think I told him the story about how every, every <laughs> single freaking game he would look at me and I always have something. But I was just like, you know what? Someday I'm gonna I'm gonna shoot thirty six percent. Someday I'll be there, league average. <laughs> do you think uh, Do you think our Clippers team teams were good enough to win? Like, did we squander something? Um, or are we yeah, all I, just delusional and thinking no, that maybe no, we could have no, won? No, no, no. I think we had. I think our best chance was. I thought we had a chance in two thousand. 
14 playoffs. Yeah. And yeah. I'm sorry, yeah, 14 and 15 playoffs. Yeah. I thought those two years were our best years. Steph and the Warriors going sort of supernova Nova in 16 and going 73 and 9, and then they bring yeah. Kevin. And by that time, and I want to actually kind of touch on this a little bit, by, by 17, by that last year that I was there, um, and sort of I think the sixth year, year that you guys were together, Jamal was there five of those years. You, Chris, and Blake were there six years together. I am, I but, am Blake. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, DJ. Yeah, DJ. <laughs> right. <laughs> you, are, you are Blake. But uh, – but but that that sort of fourth year that I was there, like it was kind of apparent that the yeah. group was like disjointed in a way, mm -hmm. and so I kind of wanted to get your sort of take on this. So Jamal and I have said this publicly before, but like there was some pettiness there mm -hmm. that sort of uh, split us up. Split us up. Matt has mentioned mental toughness. Doc has talked a little bit about luck. I want to touch on the luck thing in a second, but sort of what do you think? Uh, enabled us to sort of squander those opportunities and, and specifically 14 and 15. 14 and 15, I think, uh, f I'm sorry, 15 <clears throat> was just a complete mental breakdown. I, like, I don't think pettiness is why we lost in the, in the playoffs, <laughs> especially not that year. No, no, not that year. Not uh, that or year. or, th or uh, the year before we lost to Oklahoma City. Yeah. Pettiness didn't lose that, those, <laughs> those, those seasons for us. The next and then the next season was you were hurt most of the year. That was when we lost to Portland, and then you and got you and Chris got hurt in the first round, which was luck. Seven, Portland seventeen Utah. in seventeen, you got hurt in the first round again. Some luck. Those first two years, again, I I totally agree with you. Like those groups were two of my favorite groups, if not the favorite my favorite groups that I've had in fifteen years of my career. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, those were you very, could very sense great. it a little bit in sixteen. I feel like. Uh, and then in 17, like we started the season, I think 13 and two. And then it was just like, it was like downhill after that. Yeah. Um, like, yeah. So, so those two years, I think were the years that we really could have won before that we weren't ready. We didn't, I don't think we had the right team. Um, it's cause you didn't I, have number I, four. I, yeah. Once we got JJ, <laughs> the final, game, game the final infinity stone. Is in place. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just I, I've said this to people like I don't think on like a like publicly, but I've said it, I've said it just to people when they always ask me about the Clippers. I am in the camp where it wasn't quite as bad as people try to make it out to be. I really don't think it was. Maybe towards the end, maybe like when some 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 other things happen, but especially not. That's not the reason we didn't win a championship. Because our two chances to win a championship were those two years. After that, like you said, the Warriors and LeBron, they were just going back and forth. And it was, that was crazy. We, we weren't good enough in 17. No. Um, 16, we had a very small window for about two and a half hours um, prior to um, game four, I yeah, think, in Portland. In Portland. Yeah. Steph sprains his knee. And then oh, yeah. right. uh, in the second half, you tore your quad tendon and CP broke his hand. And there was our little window to win yeah. the West. That that was gone. Yeah. Fourteen and fifteen were absolutely and 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 I think in describing sort of pettiness, I, that was more in reference to that fourth year because up until that last year, like I had just enjoyed my experience so much. Yeah. Um, I kind of agree with Matt on the mental toughness thing. Like there were some things that happened in those playoff runs in in fourteen and in fifteen that were just like a little bit of a, a breakdown. Yeah. Which is shocking, considering what we had to go through in the first round in fourteen yeah. with the Golden State yeah. series and having to oh, deal with the yeah, Sterling that, stuff. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So the uh, I mean, you know, there's there's like I remember like going. I, I think it was the you know when we were at Oklahoma City for Game Five, and you know we were up, and then we just tricked off that that lead. Like our mental toughness needed to be better after that. You know what I mean? Correct. It, to me, it wasn't like like it wasn't pettiness, like I keep saying, but it was just like we we were so deflated by that game that we couldn't pick ourselves back up to come home and and win one and then force a game seven. And think, we still would have had to go back on the road and win a game seven. I think, whatever. I, I think we were up nineteen in the second quarter against OKC in game six at home, and Kevin Durant went nuclear. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's and right. again, it was mental toughness because yeah, yeah, like yeah. we didn't respond to that that run he had in the second quarter that brought the game within striking distance, and then we, we didn't have a great second half, and the season was over. Yeah. Um, when, when these runs are happening, like obviously in the Houston series, is there just a part of you that's just like, here we go again? No. No. Uh, no. I, I want to say game six, like I still go back. I go back to that all the time. I think about it all the time. 
And I was so sure that team was going to win a championship. I was so sure of it. And when when that happened, um, like you're in the moment, you're like this this is like Josh Smith is hitting three step three step back Brewer. threes, Brewers hitting threes. Like you're kind of like what what's going on? Like we're still we're still better than these guys. We're you know we're going to still win this game. We don't win the game. We go to game seven. I don't know if you remember this. We came out of a timeout in the second half uh, in game seven against Houston. I came over to you and I was like, I was like, BG, like, I don't think I've ever been this tired in my life. Yeah. yeah. Like that that. run that it was the, it was an accumulation too of the first round against the Spurs. Yeah. And it was also, remember we had to play without CP the first two games of the Houston series. So that just like, when you take him off the floor, now everybody has, everybody's job has to go up exponentially because he does so much. He did so much for us. So I think I think that was part of it too. At least for me, I felt like those first two games were like exhausting, and we split them, and we had to, and we won a game. But I think it was just a lot of the like seven game series with the Spurs, and that that Spurs series was so mentally, we were so mentally locked in. Yeah, I don't think I've ever. I cry. It was so weird because I I played in a lot of playoff games, and I I've never won a championship, but I made the finals, and. That was the only series that I cried after that we won. <laughs> like I cried. That series was, they were def- yeah. the defending champs. Yeah. And I feel like we took their best. Sh- we were a better team. We really were, yeah, yeah, but yeah. like we took their best shot. Yeah. Um, I want to, I want to sort of bring up like something that happened in my career when I was in LA and that's, I discovered this action and it was an action with you. I call it throw and go. Yeah. It happened so organically. Yeah. Um, like no one really like taught us how to do it. I, I, I've said this before, but I stole it from, from Bradley, Bradley Beal. They used to have a play where he would zip her up, catch her to the top of the key, and he'd throw it to Nene um, on, on one of the elbows, and then he would just sort of cut off. Mm-hmm. Nene would sometimes DHO, sometimes he'd back cut, sometimes he'd push off and pop back for a three. And so, like, I started, like, just organically doing this with you. Yeah. And, like, it kind of changed my career, to be honest with you. Those, like, DHOs were yeah. just, like, those were so much fun. <laughs> because, one, you, I mean, bless whoever's heart has to guard you and run around for however many, 36 minutes a game, whatever you were playing at the time. But, dude, we had, like, I, I tell, like, some of our, like, my younger guys this now. It's like, dude, we had that offense down to just like a science like we knew cp's coming up left side dj step up he's rolling if he doesn't have it I'll, I'll fly up he'll throw it back to me or he'll go same side i'll go dho with you i'll hit ahead to you you'll come back to me i'll hit right back to you i'll roll now somebody's got to come over you hit me D- i got a lob to dj maybe i have matt over here maybe you have the shot maybe you go back to cp then then there's just back in cp's hands yeah. And one of us is rolling back up. Like yeah. it, that offense was just like, you know, after a couple of years of being together, like, we, you know, we'd start training camp, dude. And it was just, it was beautiful to like be a part of. Cause it yeah. was just kind of like, just everybody knew what we were doing. It was the funnest. It was the funnest I, I had off playing offensively. My, the other play that, uh, which was a set play, we'd always save it for the fourth quarter, but CP would bring it down the left side Matt would be in the the left corner. I would be in the right corner. DJ would be in the dunker on the right side. And you'd come up to set a pick, and everybody would ice it. Mm-hmm. And you would just slip the screen. You'd catch it on a short roll, and you either had dunk, lob to DJ. If my man cracked on DJ, I had a corner three. Yeah. And it was like, so finally the smart teams stopped icing or yeah, downing yeah, yeah. The, the pick yeah. and roll, and they would allow CP to come middle. But I, you know, I, I, this brings me to like something I wanted to ask you about. Do you feel like your intelligence, everybody for, throughout your career has, has sort of talked about and, and highlighted your athleticism. Do you feel like your intelligence as a player gets overlooked? Um, I don't really know, to be honest. I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know. I think uh, coaches and, and like, especially when I went to Detroit and I had yeah. like coaches here and there, like they like – would come to me all the time and we'd have like great conversations about basketball. And I never really had that before, <laughs> you know? Um, so I don't know, maybe I don't, I don't know what people's perception is. I mean, I think the, the average NBA fan like has no clue. If yeah. Somebody's smarter. They know the, the guys who get talked about all the time. 
Um, it's not sexy doing a, a highlight tape of you short rolling and then kicking out to the <laughs> corner three. <laughs> no, um, you're right. Gotta but that's but that ultimately again. is basketball. Like that's yeah. I guess that's my point is like being like a cog, being sort of that valve. Mm-hmm. Like you were our valve on that team. Like like as much as CP had the ball in his hands, the offense was really built around you either running pick and rolls with with uh, with CP or you running into DHOs with me. So we would get some DJ, we would get some big big pick and rolls every now and then. That's true. Um, but that, again, the ball's in your hands. Yeah, I don't know. I mean. I don't know. I couldn't. I couldn't really tell you that. Thank you, though, for, for bringing that up. Um, I I just want to go back to something I asked earlier about Peak Blake. Mm-hmm. Peak Blake to me was, I think, a twenty-eight game stretch in two thousand thirteen, two thousand fourteen, when CP had. I think he had a shoulder injury. Yeah. He fell on a trip shoulder, in Texas. Hand, wrist. Yeah, shoulder. Yeah, shoulder, yeah, like shoulder. I think it was yeah, in it was, San Antonio or something, and. You went on like a 28 game stretch where you averaged like 28, 11, and seven. Mm-hmm. You kept us in the hunt for the number one seed. Like that, maybe not, maybe not in terms of like the passing and the, you know, the, the full, full package and the shooting and all that, but that was like as dominant as I ever saw you. Yeah. I mean, and I think I that was the year you were like third, you were third in the NBA, NBA yeah. MVP yeah. that year. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I, people say that, but. <laughs> People used to say, I had this joke where it was like, people would say like, oh, you know, he was in the conversation for the MVP running. And it was, the joke was like, the conversation is, you know, Kevin Durant and LeBron, like they've had unbelievable years. One of them's going to win MVP. You know who's not going to win MVP? <laughs> Blake Griffin. Like that was the conversation. But you're mentioned. Like I was third, but it was like a, dis, a very distant third. Like it wasn't, it wasn't going to happen. But yeah, that year, you know, what's crazy about that, that stretch though. Jamal was huge. Yeah, uh, Darren Collison was great. You, Matt, DJ, like we all, everybody. I I specifically remember like some games where like Jamal and and Darren Collison especially. Like, did you did you see this is this is uh, it might be off base, but did you see? I was thinking about this with your run this year with this team mm-hmm. and just how important injuries are yeah. in the grand scheme of things. Are there? Do you see any parallels there in terms of just like when you are missing a cog? Obviously, James was out, and then. Kai goes down. It's really hard to win. It's really hard to get to the finals oh, without yeah. without players like this. I mean, I thought we still had a shot to beat. Uh, could have beat Milwaukee with with Kai. Yeah. Uh, when Kai went out, it, I mean, it just like changes your whole team. And James came back and and like literally gutted it out for three games. But I mean, you could everybody could see he wasn't like himself. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, I mean that that was like that was a very different situation to me because it was like we we had Milwaukee down two zero. You were smack you were smacking you smacking the yeah. first two. I mean, and they 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 changed some things. They played great. Middleton stepped up all that, um, and they were great. They deserved that win. But um, I still thought we had a chance without without um or if we had Kai. We asked we asked Drew this. Did you think Kevin Durant shot was a three? I no, I didn't. I thought yeah. I thought he was inside the line. I didn't yeah. know it was that close. I thought he was yeah. inside the line when it went in. Uh, Jeff Green was like, "That was a three. and I was. I th- that's when I like started yeah. looking up. But just in my mind, I, I didn't think it was a three. Yeah. Um, so we had we had drew on after the Olympics, and he was talking about KD. He was talking about both playing against him and then playing with him. Mm-hmm. And the word, the phrase he used was, uh, "KD was mentally penetrating the Bucks." <laughs> And that's just, All that's right. whatever. That's what he said. <laughs> yeah. What was your game five and game seven, just being out there with him, watching him just sort of go into like God mode? I mean, you've, you've had a lot of great performances in the playoffs. You've been up, you've seen a lot of other guys have them. What are you thinking like when this is all happening? Honestly, he, he was, he does stuff all the time where you're just like, what is, what, how did he just, it's just the – and it's honestly the, the stuff that's most impressive to me is like the, you know, dribble, dribble, like pull up mid-range where the hand is faced and just hit it. It's not really like – like it is like the spin move, like the tough shots like that. That's all tough, but he just is so, unaff- so unaffected by any defender. I have never seen a player be less affected by somebody than Kevin Durant. And when he was doing that, it was just kind of like – 
you I was just trying to figure out ways to like support him in a way because I knew he was tired and he was just like doing that so you, you know like like in that when he hit that shot I was like sprinting baseline in case and that I, I had fouled out but I wish I'd still been in for that second shot because I was going to do the same thing yeah I when he hit that shot on Brooke Lopez I just sprinted by him like hoping that like if he missed like I was down there for it so that was like kind of like how I tried to like support him in that moment but you kind of just give it to him and then you try to move around a little bit so so that the other guys don't just double team him so it's, it kind of looks like you're doing something yeah, yeah it's a fake hustle <laughs> yeah. it's, it's the best way to describe it um but it's kind of crazy man because we have like kai and james are the same way too like when they get going you're just like Jeez, these guys are so good what what was that adjustment like for you over the last year in sort of going from the guy like you were in LA and Detroit to, you know, a tertiary player, a, a, a role player. Was that a hard adjustment? I know you know what you were getting into in, in Brooklyn, yeah. but just in terms of like, you know, the, the overall arch of, of your emotions about letting go of that. It's a hard thing that, to that, let go that, let go of. That, that wasn't that hard for me. To wasn't like let go of that. Um, it, for me, the toughest thing was just figuring out their, the way they wanted me to play or the way that I can like sort of help them support that team the best. And like, it's different for everybody. You know, Kai has such a different style than James and James and, yeah. and, and Kevin. So it's like, you kind of have to really like get to know them and like their game. And the great thing about James is he does an unbelievable job. I didn't really know this about him. I knew he was like a, a you know, a good passer and orchestrator yeah. and all that, but the way he talks, the game is, is special. Um, and, and he like really like has like a plan you know, every time, every time out. And, you know, like Doc used to say this all the time, but it's more important it, getting it, getting it right is more important than being right. So like for us, it's just like, let's just get on the same page, which, which, whichever way we choose to do something, like let's just get on that page. You know what I mean? Because there's more than one way to go about it. When, um, when, when you're, when you're looking ahead to this year, I don't, I don't have the exact number, but I think like the three of them played what, like, seven games uh, yeah, yeah something like that like under yeah. 10 yeah. games together all season obviously counting the playoffs um is there an element of like it's like if we just stay healthy i don't not to be over cocky or anything like that but like the sky is literally the limit when you look at what happens when those guys are on the court together because we really haven't seen it yeah i mean if we i mean uh, you know again i think i th- like i said i think we had a chance to beat milwaukee with kai yeah um yeah and if we have all three of them um, I think you have a chance to, you know, do something special, but got to be healthy. I mean, Milwaukee stayed healthy. That was like, yeah. that's their, that was one of their things that like got them to that point. That point. I mean, besides Giannis and Drew and Chris being unbelievable and I, supporting guys. I was going to ask you about that. I think it was the second or third, right before the playoffs. You had that crazy alley oop, the one with. Uh, was with Mike James and with oh, oh, yeah, the whole yeah, team yeah. where someone went behind the back and did it. Yeah. Was there like, what was going through your head? Like when that was happening? Uh, honestly, I was like, that was, <laughs> this is crazy. And Jared Allen, Jared Allen looks at me and goes, man, I missed that. <laughs> 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 I was like, yeah. that, that was a, that was a wild play. One of the, one of the wildest I've been a part of it. Also, it was also great to like start that off by a pass, <laughs> you know? Just get out of the highlight early. Now is the time to celebrate. The first NFL Sunday of the season is about to kick off, and DraftKings, the official daily fantasy partner of the NFL, is putting you in the center of this weekend's action. New customers can get a free shot at a $1 million top prize with their first deposit by signing up using code JJ. Get in on the action now. It's simple. Just pick your lineup, stay under the salary cap, and see how your team stacks up against the competition. Feel the NFL action like never before with a free shot at a million dollar payday. Download the DraftKings app now and use code JJ. This week, new customers can get a free shot at the $1 million top prize and compete for millions of prizes across all contests. Enter code JJ to get a free shot at the $1 million top prize with your first deposit. That's code JJ only at DraftKings, the official daily fantasy partner of the NFL. Minimum $5 deposit required. Eligibility restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com for details. Tommy, I know we talk all the time about some of my gambling habits on the golf course, but I just want to let you know that I I had a big week last week. Oh, yeah? I had a big week. What happened? I won all three of my games. 
got paid out. I mean, I'm not betting heavy money here, not heavy action, but you know, two, three hundred bucks here and there. Um, there's a member at Marion that I I took two hundred twenty dollars off. He said it was the most money he's ever lost on the golf course in his life. Did you find the three worst members of the club to get your mojo back? No, the guy's like a six handicap. Okay. I played well. He didn't play well. What are you gonna say? Okay. Anyways, had to get paid. Guy didn't have any cash on him, and I told him to pay me in Cash App. Easy. What else can you do on Cash App? You can also buy crypto. Explore the crypto world. Yeah, it's a versatile app. I, I mentioned this earlier, and we, we talked about the shooting sort of repetition and the um, the diligence there. Um, the mirror drill. Yeah, the mirror drill. <laughs> but I, I like I witnessed this uh, every day for four years. Like you are. I would say the most meticulous, diligent athlete that I have personally been around. I'm not saying you're more diligent or more meticulous than me, mm-hmm. but you're so up there. Sure. Thank, thank you, man. <laughs> but you're up there. There was a New York Times uh, headline that said I was the most meticulous player. So maybe you get one A. Who wrote that? <laughs> Plant, planted that. <laughs> <laughs> but in all in all seriousness, um, you you I, like I, I I watched you work on your body, work on your craft over and over and over. You were like the first guy wearing a whoop. Mm-hmm. You were like early on hyper ice. Mm-hmm. Um, like the injury part of it, mm-hmm. where you're doing everything you can to control sort of an outcome. Mm-hmm. And then you have some unlucky injuries. Were there ever any like dark places that you went? Oh, yeah. I assume that the frustration level had to be super high. Yeah, the, um, the darkest moment I had um, was in Utah. When I when I I stepped back and I knew I like tore something in my foot, tried to play a couple more minutes and then came out and I got the, I went to the MRI during the game, um, and the, our team doctor came in and told me what happened, like what the type of surgery was and all that, and I just broke down in this room by myself, and I remember saying, um, I think to my agent or, or whoever was there at the time, I remember saying like, why do I, why do I do all this shit? <laughs> like, why do I fucking sit in ice baths and take all these supplements, have a strict diet? I've used oxygen chambers. I've used cryo machines. I've, you know what I mean? You just spend money. You spend time, like time away from my family like on game days, I would like I tried this oxygen chamber for a while. Like I was away from my kids for like an hour because I had to zip did up you, in this stupid. Did you ever do thing. the sensory deprivation thing? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. You did that. Yeah, yeah. You were also was it called BFR? Yeah, BFR. Yeah, you were the first yeah. guy I saw do BFR. Yeah. Um, but once I came out of that like hole, that dark, that darkness, um, I like kind of said to myself like, you know, every single time I've had one of these injuries, I've come back from it and I've been okay and continued my career and continue to play at like a level that I wanted to. And, and, um, obviously age catches up with everybody. You're not going to be the same player your whole life unless you're LeBron. Um, (laughs) somehow, (laughs) uh, no one knows. So, you know, I, I, um, you just kind of have to look at it from a different perspective. And that's what I had to do. Just be like, can't feel sorry for myself. Like, I might not even have the chance to be playing right now if I hadn't done all those things. Like those injuries might have knocked me out. Like I might have been completely done. That's so. actually a, that's a that's a really good perspective to have. And you're you're healthy now. I think we were talking about this on the golf course the other day. But essentially, this is you know this is a clean off season for you. You're not coming uh, off in injuries. No, You've been great. able to train like you want to train. You yeah, feel great. I feel great. I um I honestly feel better than I have in probably like three summers. Um, and, and, you know, again, like guys have to like keep, keep thinking that cause you know, I've had obviously my fair share of injuries, but, um, you know, try to keep coming back. So lots of dunk shots this year. Yeah. <clears throat> I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to have a few Detroit, Detroit fans are, <laughs> gonna be, Detroit fans are going to be, uh, <laughs> triggered. listen, sorry guys, <laughs> nobody wanted it more than me. <laughs> Dunking was kind of my thing. <laughs> it all got taken away a, from me. <laughs> I, I have a clipper. I have a clipper question for both of you. In retrospect, at the the DeAndre uh, Dallas, that mm-hmm. free agency thing, mm-hmm. which I feel like, uh, like there's a certain type of NBA fan that remembers it vividly. A lot of them, especially younger fans, might not even know what this is. Is there anything like in retrospect that you think about that, or is it like where is that now? 
the only thing I would have done differently is I would have stuck around. Because, like, once we got the confirmation and then we were waiting on some, I think, we, what was the chicken place? Canes? Uh, Raisin Canes, yeah. Yeah. And we were waiting on the on the chicken. We were playing spades. Paul Pierce was trying to cheat, all that stuff. <laughs> but, like, once we got confirmation that DJ was coming back, I kind of went up to DJ and I was like, DJ, like, hey, um, I got a two and a half hour drive back to Austin. <laughs> Is it cool if I leave? <laughs> He's like, yeah, motherfucker, it's fine, whatever. But in retrospect, I wish I would have stayed till midnight because I missed a lot of shenanigans. But in fairness to me, Chelsea was like eight and a half months pregnant. Yeah. So I didn't want to be like, I didn't want to be in Houston right if she went into yeah. labor. <laughs> Locked in the house. Yeah. That was uh, so much fun <laughs> because it was just like, once he, once he was like, yeah, I'm coming back, it was just like free reign to think of whatever you could to just like keep, keep this thing going. Keep trolling people. NBA. It felt like the beginning of like the NBA internet to a certain extent about how people just obsess about the weirdest shit. And if you just really want, if you really decide you want to like kind of like use your powers for good or evil, you really can warp perspective. Yeah. I think that was the most fun. I mean, I guess I, I'm biased because I was involved, but that was probably one of the most fun days on NBA Twitter. It was for me too. It was for me. It was great. And the whole, the whole, the whole thing about it was Blake had had DJ, uh, dinner with DJ the night before. And I had talked to Blake that morning. I was the first one at the hotel. We all met at the Four Seasons, and I was the first one at the hotel. And Blake was like, "Yeah, no, he's coming back. It's done. <laughs> yeah. He just yeah. he just wants everybody to show up for him." I was like, "All right, <laughs> cool." No, I think I think you know I think it was good. That was a good thing that we all kind of like sat there and were like everybody at the same time like showed him like, "Hey, like we we want you back." Um, Sometimes yeah. you assume things. Like I feel like I there's been times in my career where I'm like, "Oh." I can't believe that guy sure. left. Like, sure. I wish I thought he was coming back. I thought it was a done deal. Yeah. And, you know, there's different factors every time somebody goes into free agency. So I think it's the lesson learned for sure is that express a, a, a person's importance in, in, in your life yeah. to them. You know, it's also weird with me with DJ. I was, I was kind of like. As a as a friend, like a, as a as a true friend, you kind of want to say like or I did say like, you know, I know you got to make you know whatever decision obviously you want to but like in retrospect i kind of wanted to be like all right you're not going anywhere like <laughs> yeah. just sign like you know you, we, we got to have you we can't not have you you know what i mean yeah so like it's a weird thing for for being a friend with somebody who's like trying to make this decision and you're like you know if they're completely not happy or they're thinking something else like and they they're not saying it like you want to be supportive either way but i should have just been like all right bro like what, what are we doing dallas Come on, let's go. Chandler Parsons? <laughs> I'm sorry, that's your boy. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry, man. Sorry. Fine. The other the other thing we were talking that JJ and I were talking about before you uh before you got here was the he didn't even stretch though video. Oh yeah. Um have you I think I saw a clip of you watching it once, but like have you watched it anytime since that one time or uh so the one that I watched it was at USA basketball. Yeah. And there's like 12 pro guys who are like stars of the league now. I had no clue all those guys were in that video. I knew some of them. It's crazy. But I didn't know. Like obviously uh, D'Angelo Russell, obviously, because he was kind of like the star of that video. Zach is in it. But when they paused it and there were so many of those guys, like Diamond Stone, remember Diamond? Yeah. Diamond Stone was in that. I mean, he's not in the league anymore, but. He was on our Clippers team for a hot second. (laughs) For four months. (laughs) Uh yeah, it was. Uh, that was a. <laughs> he told me today that Josh Hart's in it, which I didn't even realize. Yeah, Josh, Josh is, is in it. In it. Josh yeah. and Trey Lyles is in it. Zach looks. Yeah, Zach looks like he's. Zach I don't know how old he is, but he looks like he's nine. Yeah, like he's, yeah. he's super baby faced. That was, yeah, was, was. What crazy. What's next with the comedy? Um, I don't really. You know, I don't really like go up and do time unless I'm working for something or working on something. Um, Have you done seller? Comedy seller, yeah. Um. I did that when I was working on my last charity event. Uh, it was like a stand-up show. Um, so I haven't really, I have a bunch of stuff that I need to like work out, but I, I, especially now when comedians have been cooped up for like, you know, ever and not been able to work on material, I don't, but the last thing I want to do comedy-wise is show up to a thing and like take somebody's time. Let's boot them, yeah. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like that, so that's why I do like, I'll do like my um, charity charity event where I get to bring people in and like, they get to showcase some of their stuff. Yeah, you know? well, that's always the thing with with Chappelle, especially at the cellar, is he's he always makes an effort to come to the last show and go last. 
Yeah. Because he knows he's going to go for like two hours. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. basically everyone who was booked after him is done. Yeah. And that's a yeah. check. That's like a check they're losing basically by yeah. not being able to go up. For but sure. the, we were watching the, uh, the Alec Baldwin roast. <laughs> like you like legit killed that more than anybody else. Well, I went up and practiced like eight times in LA. <laughs> I would just go and I would ask to get on like the end of a show. Yeah. And I would just go up there and I would be like, hey guys, I'm uh, working on uh, some jokes for this roast. And then so I would just kind of like set up the, sh the the dais and I would just go and I would scratch jokes off, you know, a joke that didn't work or didn't land or, or I had to rework it. And I like put time in on that because I was so pumped about I I grew up watching those roasts and I was so pumped about doing that. What's what's sick about it though is like I feel like I mean we we like so many players have podcasts now. So many players are like VC this. They, like uh, players are very active in everything. Yeah, no, no other player. No other player is doing stand-up. doing stand-up comedy. No, <laughs> not even close. Like no, it's just it's not. It's not a thing that like anyone else, to my knowledge, has even like attempted. Well, if you want to make big money, <laughs> you get into stand-up <laughs> comedy. Into stand -up. It's just something I've loved for so long, and like I can't remember. I got presented with the opportunity to do it, and I was like. I got to host a show, you know, so I got to bring up comedians and stuff, and it was like exhilarating. Also, it's like that was in that was Montreal, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like sort of like when I I realized like I have to like really be challenging myself every off season, like find something that like scares the shit out of you and like do it. Did, and, did you ever bomb? No, but like by the time I'm up there, like the crowd kind of like the crowd will give you some give you laughs. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I haven't been like an open mic or you know get up there and nobody knows <laughs> you know what i mean like it's I, hard it's hard for you I've, to walk I've in somewhere they those don't know. steps so i yeah. say that i 1000 percent would have laughed every i mean bombed every comedian ever no matter how big has, do you have like a bombed. joke book that you carry around i have a notes folder notes folder yeah. do it all on your phone yeah i just keep a bunch can of you, notes can you give us a joke <laughs> The, so just these are give all, us a joke man <laughs> these are all this is make us laugh just be funny make us laugh clown <laughs> um it's like okay these are very stupid and like obviously i haven't worked on them yet and but you'll get an idea of like i'll put them in this and i'll come back and work on it i i for some reason wrote down my goal in life is to never have to play in a celebrity softball game <laughs> <laughs> which like just makes me laugh and i don't know how you make that into an actual joke yeah. but it's just full of like really small <laughs> um yeah just like really short uh, uh, what, what made you laugh what made you laugh i can't say that one I'm sorry. <laughs> some of them get a little dark <laughs> um but it's just stuff like that where did the where did the mclovin shoes come from uh i just <clears throat> they were like you know Jordan lets you do like a certain amount of PEs and like, you know, they sort of give you like categories. Like if you have your own ideas, they're like favorite movie. So mine was, um, super mine's bad. super bad. Yeah. I did like an office one, um, I think two years ago or so, where I, they had put like my face on the, uh, prison mic, prison <laughs> mic, uh, bandana. Um, so, Do you know, he used to rap. Yeah, well, that's what, that's yeah. the reason I was asking about the joke book. Cause I used yeah. to carry around uh, a lyric book. Mm hmm. <laughs> that um i misplaced we keep trying to get these oh, boy, raps really? on this show yeah, yeah. And, and well like in a I don't move wanna... or like you <sighs> left it somewhere like i think public. i know who has it oh okay yeah i don't want to talk about this publicly <laughs> our idea we want to have we want to have uh dame come on and he knows what he's getting into but he has to judge yeah. he has to hear his him rapping and just like do live yeah, no, live I've, rapping. I've got well I've, no i've got a couple mixtapes I've got a couple oh, of mixtapes. Oh my god, <laughs> that's incredible! Remember when Lil Wayne used to uh, rap like Wheezy would rap over like other yeah, people's just, beats? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that was those were my mixtapes. And then my buddies in college started just making. Boring. Shout out to Ryan Curlew, but he started making um, beats specifically for me. Oh, nice! Yeah, and then custom, I would. <laughs> custom, <laughs> custom. I love beats. that he just compared himself to Wayne well, yeah, mixtapes. Yeah. So you know how you know how one of the greatest rappers of all time would do this thing. <laughs> Yeah, that okay. So that was like, me. You know how George Carlin used to do stand up? Like, that's what I was like. <laughs> how did I get into stand up? I don't know. I watched Dave Chappelle and I was like, I can do that. I can do that exact so, thing. <laughs> and here we are. <laughs> wow, boy. Uh, All right. Yeah. I think that's let's a good I think that's a good way to end the show. That's a good way to end the show. I think we got the takeaway from this episode. <laughs> Boy, that was All great. Right. Uh, Blake, this was awesome, man. Appreciate yeah, it. Thanks for having me, guys. Thank yeah, you for the wine. Great. Thank you. <laughs>